you are so fat. I hate this body. You're such an idiot. How could you be so stupid? Look at you. You're disgusting. It's a little embarrassing for me to have you listen in to the thoughts in my head. But my thoughts are with me all the time. When I'm meeting someone new, when I'm with an old friend, when I'm standing in front of you on the TED stage. And when my thoughts talk to me like that, I feel awful. I get this knot in the pit of my stomach. My throat begins to shut down. And I just want to disappear. And I feel like I'm about this tall. Do you have voices? Do your ears talk to you like that? In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to consider changing your perspective. One of the hardest things I think there ever is to do. It is a challenge I give myself every day, and some days I'm better at it than others. But I can tell you from experience that if it's something you're willing to consider doing and to step into, it is the very best thing you could ever do for yourself. In my work as an image and presence coach and consultant, I have the opportunity to work with amazing, beautiful, brilliant women, hundreds of them, all ages, all roles, different circumstances and situations. And it's so interesting to me because they're so different, but there's always one consistent thing that I can count on with each of them. And that is every single one of them will have something critical to say about herself. They push and they prod and they poke and they've got too much of this and you know not enough of that, but they always have multiple things to say about themselves that they don't like, that they don't think they're enough. Glamour Magazine did a study in their readership and what they discovered was that 97% of women will say at least one mean thing to themselves, about themselves, every day. And the average was closer to 15. 15 things that we say to ourselves to be mean to ourselves. The other interesting thing to me in working with these women is that we all have a need to call it out, to make sure that I say it before you see it. I do it all the time. I catch myself. Someone will say, Jean, you look great today. And I will say, oh, look at these bags under my eyes. And do you know, I spent a whole minute in the mirror this morning trying to get this spot off my face, and then I realized it's a new age spot. <laughs> it is interesting, the things that we do to ourselves. So I really decided to get to the bottom of this. Where does this come from? Why do we do this to ourselves? It's easy for us to look at the media and blame them. And there's a lot of that happening these days. And it's absolutely true that in the images that they present to us, there are only 5% of women that we see ourselves. The other 95% of us, we don't see ourselves at all in those images. So there are a lot of movements toward body acceptance, and I fully support those. I think those are wonderful. We're hearing more and more about them. But I need to say, for me, there's something about that word acceptance that kind of sticks in my craw a little bit. The definition of acceptance is the perception of being adequate. I don't know about you, but adequate to me feels kind of flat. Kind of like, oh yeah, you know, if I can't have anything better, I guess I'll accept it. I think there has to be something more. So it's interesting because when we begin to look at where these thoughts in our head come from, I think the majority come from the voices in our heads. 
And our voices come from our experiences. Now, I don't mean to minimize the complexity of this because there are hundreds and hundreds of experiences that create these voices in our heads. I was breaking up with a man, and the man I was ending the relationship with said horrible, mean, terrible, abusive things to me about how ugly I was and how what a horrible person I was and how I didn't deserve him. And my logical brain said, see, he's, this is why you do not need to be in this relationship. He is not good for you, and you do not deserve this. But there was this little, tiny part of me, way deep inside, that heard him and believed every word he said. And it's the same part of me that believed my ex-husband when he told me I could lose a few pounds to look better and believed my college boyfriend when he said I'd be prettier if I were blonde and believed my mother when she, when I was in that terrible puberty stage, when she called me her ugly duckling and a hundred other experiences that contributed to that little place. And that little place inside of me, I call her Drusilla because she's my mean stepsister. Drusilla remembers every word that was said, and she repeats it to me regularly. She shows up all the time. So we have these voices in our head. Drusilla's talking in my head all the time over and over, and we play these tapes, and we play them, and we begin to believe them, and it impacts our perception of ourselves. There is a study that was done, published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, published in 2015, and what they discovered was that in every country in the world, women have lower self-esteem than men. But here's what's fascinating about this research. The more industrialized a country is, the wider the gap between how little women think of themselves and how highly men think of themselves. What is wrong with that? The more educated we are, the less we think of ourselves. So our self-perception impacts how we show up in the world. It begins to erode our self-confidence, our self-esteem, and it impacts our powerful ability to show up. The price tag that we are paying for this is a really high one. There are a couple of pieces of research that I'd like to additionally share with you just to talk about the price tag that we are paying for maintaining this self-perception. The first one, published in the Journal of Economic Psychology in 2011, talks about the impact of self-esteem on earnings. And what they discovered in this research is that self-esteem, the character trait of self-esteem, has equal if not greater impact than education and skill level on our earnings. In other words, our low self-esteem is directly impacting our pocketbook. Well, I don't like that very much. I don't know about you. The second piece of research that I want to share with you has to do with self-esteem and relationships. This one published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology in 2013 talks about the impact of low self-esteem when you're in relationship with someone, whether it's your partner, whether it's another person. But people with low self-esteem put that on other people. So we begin to project what we see as our imperfections on that other person, and we tend to live in a really black and white world. The relationship is either good or bad. I would attest, I would be willing to bet that my ex-husband would attest to the fact that the standards I set for our relationship were ones that neither one of us could live up to. So I really began to look at the price that I personally was paying to maintain this level of self-esteem for myself. And I think I really had to face some serious facts about the fact the business opportunities that I have not pursued because Drusilla told me I was not smart and I was not capable enough for them. 
and relationships that I have not been willing to step into because Priscilla told me I was ugly and stupid and they wouldn't want me. That makes me sad to think about. And I decided to choose no more this low self-esteem that I have created for myself, no more. So I began to look at what are the things that perhaps I could do to maybe shift that. And I have a couple of ideas, things that I've been playing with that I'd like to present, suggest to you. The first one has to do with our bodies and how we perceive our bodies. So what if more than body acceptance, we moved into body integration? What if our bodies are our teachers, our partners? What if our bodies are the way we get to show our giftedness to the world? So as an example, my wrinkly gold eyes are wise and perceptive in seeing the brilliance in other people and the brilliance in me. And my expanding waistline is just a demonstration of the comfort level that I am developing with other people. I can buy, hey, I can buy that. <laughs> it is integration. It is more than acceptance. It's owning what we have and the gifts that we bring and how we show up in the world. The second idea that I have is about those voices. Now, I'm really clear. Drusilla has set up permanent residence in my head, and she's not going anywhere. So rather than try to evict her, which I've tried multiple times, doesn't work very well, I brought in a roommate. <laughs> so Jacqueline is my strong, powerful, courageous woman. She is me at my brilliant best. And so now, rather than having a monologue in my head, we have dialogues. <laughs> so Drusilla says, you're such an idiot. And Jacqueline says, look at what a wonderful role model you are at recovering quickly from mistakes. And Drusilla says, oh, look at your flabby chin and how your face is just sagging as you get older. And Jacqueline says, Look at how wonderfully you have softened your need for perfectionism. And Drusilla, Drusilla says, look at those bat wings. And Jacqueline says, all the better to fly, my dear. <laughs> look at how beautiful you look in that gorgeous color. You really made a difference in her life. Good job. You are a bright light living out your purpose. I'm so proud of you. I refuse any longer to live in the shadow of my own creation of not good enough itis. It is not worth it. I really hope you'll join me. Thank you.